SYS presents Adventures in Online Education. Hello, friends. You're listening to SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. I'm your host, Natalie Conway. Thanks for being here. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I am so glad you are here. If you like not only listening to podcasts about education, but reading and thinking about education, you're going to want to head over to aoepodcast.org and enter your info at the bottom of the page to start receiving the AOE newsletter. It's a short weekly write-up that will get you thinking about your own teaching practice in the ideas from the show that week. Returning listeners, thanks for tuning in again. You are awesome. Today's episode is a throwback to season one. Tim Baddock and I speak about Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. It's a framework I've become really passionate about and one that comes up frequently in our episodes. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Tim and find a way to incorporate UDL into your teaching design. So, are you ready? Let's relearn something new. Hi, Tim. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Natalie. I am thrilled. You are the first podcaster who I have interviewed, so I'm slightly intimidated, but also really intrigued. Can you tell us about the podcast you used to have? Oh, very little information to tell. I've done some hosting and guesting on the topic of game design, um, especially in the realm of like tabletop role-playing game type things. Uh, mm-hmm. I find it a lot of fun, especially creating creating those games. And I think that's actually why I've had a lot of interest in gamification and education in kind of designing and curating content for that play experience. So it's actually a nice through line to our conversation today. Absolutely. We're going to be talking a lot about design mm-hmm. today. And you are a former online teacher, and you are currently managing online technology for SYS education. Why is it that you are so passionate about universal design for learning? Well, first off, it is kind of rare to get folks with a tech background in education who have actually taught. So I really try to you know, embrace that as an asset to help me understand better some of the challenges that uh, teachers and students face. And a huge piece of that challenge uh, regards to tech is accessibility. How do we make tech work the best it can for everyone? How can we remove barriers to um, being able to access that technology? So that conversation around accessibility is just already there. And universal design for learning is a fantastic way to apply these ideas of accessibility to just the whole way that teachers create structure and put out there for all that content that they create. Absolutely. And it's a framework. So it's not gimmicky. It's not this thing of the moment. It's really a way of looking at everything you do in every way you present information, in every way you're asking students to give you information and demonstrate learning back, yeah. right? Yeah, and accessibility is great. I always want to frame it as something that we can celebrate, that we can all benefit from. Uh, if we look at accessibility more as this after the fact requirement that we have to patch on to the to the well-loved mm. things we've already created and you know yes. that's the wrong mentality instead i like to pitch people with some ideas of accessible technology that we already use such as voice typing in google docs i i would throw the question out there who is that actually for everyone right Anyone everyone. who is rushing, everyone who thinks it's easier, everyone who needs it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's an accommodation for some folks who will benefit from it for sure. But at the end of the day, yeah, we all benefit from tools like that, tools like text-to-speech, word prediction. Um, everybody wins. And I think that approach to accessibility, whether it's technology in general or specifically with universal design for learning, that's the right attitude to have with it. 
And it makes me think of ADA compliance or those kind of connections. So like how ramps off the end of sidewalks make it easier for all of us to transition from a street to a sidewalk and vice versa. You know, whether you have a stroller or a kid learning to ride their bike or an old dog like I have, it's so nice to have those ramps and they are there universally for us all. Yeah. And while we're going along with that example right there, this concrete example, when would be (laughs) the best time to create the ramp? Do we pour the concrete for the stairs, have that well-worn method of uh, access, and then after the fact have to patch on a ramp that is the, the proper pitch and angle and all of that? Or do we mm-hmm. build that into the plans in the first place? Is accessibility more successful when we design with that intent in the first place? Absolutely, because UDL is proactive, not mm-hmm reactive and just like that we've all seen instances of reactive or adding on after the fact accommodations or temporary fixes and they never feel natural or they don't look physically as good Mm -hmm. all of those things in in the real concrete world and in our online instruction as well yeah it's inclusive design for all not just modifications for some. I mean, that's, that's a great, great way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone benefits and it's Mm -hmm. not diminishing at all what you're doing or, or what the student is doing. You're really simply making it accessible to everyone and and widening your lens. Mm -hmm. That kind of leads me to our next question. Why is UDL important and what does it really mean or look like for teachers and for students in an online class? For sure. Uh, One of the uh, reasons that I think UDL is important is because it is founded in, to quote them, scientific insights into how humans learn. So -hmm. there is an evidence-based component that means it's actually grounded in, you know, reality and facts in terms of, you know, if we are making these modifications to a general framework, that there are some evidence-based reasons for doing so. And because UDL is aware of, takes into account the idea that there are barriers to learning, these barriers exist, they are somewhat systemic, they lead to inequity, it specifically addresses ways to clear out those barriers, and at the end of the day, everybody benefits from fewer barriers to learning. Absolutely. That came up with previous guest, Bree North, when we were talking about barriers to communication between teachers and students. She had said that being able to Google chat or, in essence, text a teacher provided the fewer number of barriers than maybe having to write an email or even having Mm -hmm. to speak up in class. And I think it's really important that we keep that in mind. How many barriers are we putting in place to student engagement or students communicating effectively with us because inequity in education is a real issue and it's something that we're starting to grapple with more actively now in the lenses we are looking through whether we realize it or not in the centering we do of our own lived experience can really hinder us so if we just think about it as how we would enter the classroom and what we would need personally that we're, we're not doing justice to the plethora of students in front of us and we really need to consider all the learners before we hit publish or before we go live with an idea otherwise we're going to limit the amount that we see from just our day-to-day lives from that narrow focus i agree and i think you described um you know a really good example of how students on the receiving end of this um, experience successful implementation of udl because for a student they, they don't see these complex systems, these these workarounds, roundabout ways that they see attainable access and more ways to share their learning, more means of expression and representation. So for, for a student, it's just mm-hmm. a, a, a more streamlined way to uh, describe what they're thinking in a way that is measurable to teachers. Obviously, for teachers, they're designing this, so there's a little more, you know, in terms of what we see on their end. They need to really start with a clear objective. They need to have the end result in mind and focus mm-hmm. on that delivery, on reflection, so that as a iterative process, they can keep improving that down the road. 
And they also need to understand those barriers that exist. And I want to acknowledge that's difficult. I think we can all just say it is difficult to see the world through lenses that are not our own and to consider more perspectives than what we have available to us. But if we aren't really pushing to do that, how are we able to serve all learners? So let's acknowledge it's difficult, but let's do the work too. Absolutely. It's it's one thing to acknowledge the challenge, but just like we ask our students to do, right? We don't tell them to stop just because it's hard. Um, It is hard. And I think it involves collaboration a lot of the time. Having another Mm -hmm. teacher check out what you're doing and see if they can find anything or they can look at it through another set of eyes and lenses that you were not able to at the time. It's Mm -hmm. really, really valuable. So, okay, I'm a teacher. I want to start considering UDL in my lessons. I want to break down barriers. I want to limit the inequity that's happening in my class, what do I do? What does it mean to have multiple means of engagement or representation or expression, those three pillars of UDL? How do I actually do that? Well, one of the nice things that we can just sort of defer to to start is with the resources that will be included, the CAST website that outlines universal design for learning. This is all broken down into a graphic organizer, which is a fantastic way to um, you know, take in that information. Yeah. So if you if someone needs that visual approach, that's already there. But we can talk anecdotally about some uh, examples of this. Um, so, you know, one, you know, let's just talk about yeah, easy tools, easy strategies for teachers. Um, Engaging students with some structured but very low stakes peer feedback, the idea being that if the feedback is coming from student to student, it empowers them to be in the seat that a teacher often occupies, and Mm. that is going to build their engagement because their voice means so much more. Not just are they the learner, they are also the teacher in the way that their feedback can promote other students' learning. Obviously, this should be structured so that they know kind of the parameters to work within and super low stakes to start if this isn't a familiar process, but what an easy way to get the ball rolling. Absolutely. And that shared control is really important. And that time to collaborate is really important, especially Mm -hmm. when you're online, you can feel isolated and our students can too. So giving them those, like you said, low stakes, Mm -hmm. maybe it's not worth any points. Maybe it's worth participation points, who knows, but you're getting them into it and getting comfortable. Yeah, maybe it's a meaningful enough activity that that part doesn't even need to be graded, right? If it has Mm -hmm. enough meaning, then there's reason to show up. Absolutely. And moving away from that idea, this is a whole nother podcast episode, but that idea of grading and everything having to be worth a point value or something Mm -hmm. like that, if, if we're not centering that, then our kids won't either as much. And maybe that's another idea for us as well to ponder. (laughs) Yeah, there are a lot of ways to imbue meaning in work besides having a grade attached to it. But, you know, we'll we'll, we'll keep it uh, on topic here and just say, it's all about the grades. How do we support grades with UDL? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Well, and we have linked the UDL guidelines um, in the website in our show notes. So teachers can refer to that at any time and go back to it. You can print it. It's fantastic. Um, What are some easy UDL tools or strategies that teachers could start using immediately if they're listening to us today and they want to do something tomorrow or Monday? How can they what can they start with? Yeah, yeah. So I like to keep it really simple with um, online assignments, especially if some of this is feeling unfamiliar and discussion boards. I I really love discussion boards. They're so easy to set up. Obviously, Mm -hmm. they have to be set up well. But going back to that peer feedback idea of the importance of student to student interaction, um, I've used an activity I call a, a question bucket in a discussion in which students have exactly two tasks. Their first task is to post questions around a central topic that everyone's exploring. These can be very simple questions, maybe just recollecting a date, a place, or a page number. number. They can be increasingly complex, like contrasting and comparing ideas, or hypothesizing and synthesizing um, new outcomes or possibilities around that topic. But all they have to do is post those questions. The understanding is that who's answering those questions? Other students. So they are setting other students up for success, and everyone is sharing the stakes in that. 
And as a teacher, I love to just stand back and watch that happen. When yes. I've had a accompanying live class after one of these question buckets, all I do is just screen share the discussion itself and just highlight student success because they've already done most of the work. And some of the things that I can point out as a teacher is maybe different levels of questioning, some of that higher order thinking that we talked about, mm -hmm. not in a way that's positive or negative, but just distinguishing the many different ways that we can probe a topic for these interesting ideas. And all of that happened between students, and that shows that their ways of engaging are meaningful, that they were able to represent their thinking in an important way because they answered a classmate's question. That, that is an important way that they can show their thinking that another student can recognize. What's the one thing all online schools and programs struggle with? Student engagement and the ability to truly personalize interventions. How do we solve those problems? With the use of Admin Dash, a brand new Canvas LTI tool from SYS Education. Admin Dash allows online teachers to see a risk assessment score that proactively identifies students who may need more specialized attention or intervention and offers a communication log that provides an outlet for complete transparency among teachers, admin, students, and families. At just 99 cents per student per year, and with no minimum price and no fees, you can't afford to not use Admin Dash. For more information about Admin Dash, contact sales at syseducation.org and start connecting proactively with your online learners. Yes, and I love the use of discussion boards because that offers a lot of flexibility for representation. You can mm -hmm. submit a video, you can submit, you know, uh, something you hand wrote or drew in a picture mm -hmm. of that and put it up. You can write text. There are a lot of ways to engage in a discussion board. And it harkens back to what Maddie Dahl was talking about in a previous episode as well, using Google Slides mm -hmm. for that application as well and allowing students to discuss on slides and the more they're talking to one another the less our chances of centering ourselves and limiting our lenses right and the fewer barriers we place before them because we're not even there technically <laughs> technically we're yeah. there but the students are the ones engaging with one another and learning from each other i think that's really really valuable i agree and you know while we're talking visuals too i'll throw out there one mm -hmm. other UDL tool or strategy from the teacher side here. Um, I am all about reducing that decorative clutter in content. Yes, I know sir. as a former elementary teacher, that may um, make me sound like a bit of a killjoy here. <laughs> um, but I, I love the less is more approach. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of rather than using images for the sake of images, to use uh, ones that are uh, that clarify a text, contextualize it, they're recognizable. Maybe we just stick to these icons that are very simple. They're repeatedly yes. used in the same context so that students make an identification with that visual. And it's adding something to the text rather than detracting from that. Um, or if you want to just stick to different ways to format your text, if you have a large block of text, you could break it up with a text box, and all of that text, all that text box does is summarize the information or provide maybe some background knowledge. So the text is broken up visually, but it adds quality, it adds content, and I, I love that simple approach. Um, mm -hmm. Keep keep it high contrast, keep it simple, keep it recognizable. Yes. Um, I, everybody, again, benefits from that. Absolutely. And you touched on two really important things that are sticking with me. One is the mm -hmm. idea of using recognizable icons. That is so smart. Just like we we're talking about, you know, everyone uses text to speech or speech to text or, you know, those sorts of accommodations that are that could be just universally designed in our our lessons those icons should be meaningful too. So if you see, you know, the magnifying glass for doing research or you see a question mark because you're posing a question or the student's supposed to write a mm -hmm. question, things that are going to work in your class but also make sense in science or math or any other application. I think that is really essential. And then also the idea of having less on your screen or less 
visual clutter. It really helps your eyes and your mind adjust to what the stimulus is and what what is most important. And then something I've learned from you is how screen readers will look at something mm-hmm. and read it and how important that is to not have it cluttered with all this other stuff <laughs> to make oh, it yeah. more accessible. I can get into yeah how to format table headers so that a screen reader will uh, <laughs> um, successfully recognize that content, but that's that's too boring for this context. It's just <laughs> it's good to think with yeah all all accessibility in mind. I mean, if yes. someone if a learner's need that you are trying to cater to is some additional processing time with the the mm. taking in that text or that that visual piece that you've provided, giving everyone you know, less information that is more rich and has more depth in terms of what can be done with that little amount. I mean, again, everyone benefits from that and it's not taking away content just for one learner's needs. Right. Everyone benefits that. I hope that is the one thing people take away. Our listeners take away from this is that everyone benefits from universally designing learning Mm -hmm. opportunities for students and our, our content. You've given us so many examples of sound practices regarding UDL. And I know you're not a big fan of do's and don'ts necessarily, (laughs) but are there some no-nos you've seen or some suggestions you have for us regarding UDL and things that you've observed in the real world of online education? I mean, to clarify, UDL does not provide do's and don'ts because that's Mm. a sound practice on their end. I am more than happy to tell people what they should do. So, Good point of clarification there. <laughs> so starting with screen readers. Um, no, so just, this is just one example uh, linking back to uh, the discussion around screen readers and specifically ways to you know, help the, the engaging content uh, work for more readers. So if you are hyperlinking text that you've provided to another mm-hmm. URL, so it's another resource, which is, you know, it's a great thing to do. It's some curated content that someone can choose to explore, or give them background knowledge or alternatives to textual information. Great. But um, choosing a nice, long, descriptive chunk of that text to link to that website. Perfect. Do that. However, if you paste the full URL as part of the text, it it, it may look like a very innocent thing to do, but when you hear that read through a screen reader and you hear HTTP colon, um, it it drives you a little (laughs) bit crazy. And so, (laughs) yeah, it, it sounds so simple. And the only reason we don't think about that is how often are we listening to our text through a screen reader if that's not something that we personally need to benefit from. So it is expanding that lens. It's important work. And that's just one really easy example. I love that. So in other words, if I want to link an article or video or something, I should highlight the word article and link it, not just have a hyphen and then copy the entire web address like I do in so many of my emails to my fellow (laughs) staff members. (laughs) Or like a nice long descriptive chunk of text, maybe some phrases Mm. or words that are descriptive and illustrative. Um, I do have a little pet peeve of when the word that is hyperlinked is like the word it, and I'm looking at my screen (laughs) and I have like a 10 by 10 pixel little hit box that I, you know, maybe if I'm having a little trouble using my trackpad or mouse, it's difficult to select right in there. So True. let's 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 make that more accessible also. I feel like you've been reading some of my emails. <laughs> like, or listening to the article, right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> what about representation? Yeah, I was about to say, I mean, in terms of listening to information and that value. So screen readers are great. I love them. I also love when teachers are able to record audio of them, perhaps just reading instructions or other text for an assignment. Um, They're able to utilize their own voice, which is personal, meaningful. It is modeling, uh, hearing that human voice with its inflection and the way that it chooses to approach that text wonderful. My one caveat that I'd put out there is keep it simple. Um, You could take the time to record a complex video presentation with star wipes and screen capture and picture in picture. That's wonderful. But 
if you are engaging in a reflective, iterative practice of continuing to improve your content, especially when you get feedback from learners who maybe have some ideas of how to tweak that assignment to be more accessible, you're probably going to need to change those instructions or that text. And it is not mm -hmm. fun to re-record that that multi-million dollar multimedia presentation you put together. Right. Um, <laughs> Just record some embedded audio, hit record, talk like you're talking to a friend, hit stop when you're done. It's surely not going to take you longer to record it than it did to write it. And if you need True. to redo that later on, that, that barrier of entry for you is even lower. You're like, oh yeah, scrap that. Let's, let's record it again. Yes. Um, I learned the term evergreen in the last mm -hmm. year or two, trying to make things evergreen. So if you keep it simple, you can use it again and again for multiple years or multiple purposes. And mm -hmm. I've done this myself where, and I'm sure many of my fellow special ed teachers and general ed teachers have along with me, simply reading a text that mm -hmm. you've assigned to your students can be really powerful. And it doesn't take that much time, assuming you're not reading a full novel or something. It's not time consuming on the part of the teacher. And it gives you an idea for the time your students are putting into your assignment, mm. but just your familiar voice has such a positive impact and more kids than you realize always use that. They take advantage right. of it and right. it harkens back. I know I keep referring back to previous episodes and I think it's because UDL really just, if you're doing it, it runs through all of these other ideas and it really supports all of this other good teaching strategy that we've mm -hmm. talked about. But Katie Schweitzer previously said, you know, making accommodations available that we use in real life in audiobooks and text to speech, mm -hmm. like we said at the top of the episode, those are things everyone uses in real life. So, um, you know, I, it's just, that's all I have to say about that. Right. <laughs> no, I, I agree. <laughs> if, if you were to get some data of who is listening to that text that you record, that audio mm -hmm. you make so easily available, it's not just going to be the students with explicit accommodations requiring that everyone's benefiting from it and you're modeling it so well that maybe you're going to be able to get these students to record audio for each other. I mean, if their audio book yeah. is not already available, every student can record their own chapter of that, that other students benefit from. So you get that student to student learning and that engagement and meaningfulness. And you've, you've modeled that enough that students will be more comfortable sharing their voice in that same way. Absolutely. And how fun would that be? Some of them would love that. And that would be yeah. such a great opportunity for community building too. Oh, I agree. All right. The last pillar is what I'm calling them, I think, is <laughs> expression. And so what ideas do you have for us around expression? Yeah, so do's and don'ts here. Uh, I love creating assignments with just a, a full set of choices for different media types available to submit someone's thinking. So um, not just having a single way to express the way that you want to approach that assignment. Um, that's wonderful. Please do that. Mm -hmm. The one thing I've learned from experience as far as the don't side is expect that every student will be successful with every way of creating different types of media without some type of support available. And I, I have an example yes. for that. Um, I had a, a it was students were creating a hero's journey story and the multiple uh, modes of expression available were to write an essay, boring, but easy, uh, record a <laughs> video, challenging, but fun, or record a podcast. And nobody chose podcast. What? Well, this was a group of sixth graders. I had maybe a paragraph <laughs> describing what a podcast was. But I don't think I supported them enough to make that meaningful because I didn't show examples of podcasts that other students were actually creating, kiddos their age, or how a podcast yeah. is simply spoken word, radio, other familiar things that they already have background knowledge to connect that to. And I didn't provide the supports for that. So students naturally gravitated toward those means of expression that they were already comfortable and familiar with, which is great. But I need to understand that if I'm going to provide multiple media types for expression, I need to provide the same level of supports to make all of those types of media accessible. Absolutely. That's really great reflective 
teaching as well. I think we can increase our ability to use the tenants, the pillars of UDL, mm -hmm. and to really make that framework more familiar to us just by reflecting on what we're doing and looking for those alternatives, the other ways we could have engaged kids, the other ways we could have given them to represent their ideas mm -hmm. or express themselves. I think it's something that maybe isn't natural to us at first, but the more we do it and the more we reflect on what we've done and try to change it for the next time, the easier it becomes. Agreed. A hundred percent. Well, this has been so valuable. Thank you so much for kind of demystifying UDL and making it tangible for us and, and as concrete as those ramps coming off of sidewalks. I think it's just that proactive thinking that we all want to do and a really concrete way of framing it. So thank you for all the amazing information you provided us today. Oh, I'm just happy to be here. I would love to hear about what teachers come up with from um, exploring the resources that are going to be um, you know, linked with this and what they come from this, because I am coming from a limited background of more technology and all of that. I want to hear from the teachers how they make UDL something that is accessible to them and just improves their content and instruction for all students. Absolutely. The goal of our podcast is to build this really robust community of online educators. And the way to do that is to share what we're learning and share what we're doing. So I look forward to seeing some of that on, on social media in the coming weeks. All right, you heard it. People sh share that work. <laughs> Call to action. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks again, Tim. It's been really fun talking with you. Thank you so much, Natalie. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for listening to this episode of SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. Special thanks to my guest from the past, Tim Baddock. I hope you enjoyed hearing Tim's thoughts on UDL and how to design our classes so all students can succeed. If you liked what you heard today, please hit subscribe and give us a rating. On Twitter, you can follow me, Natalie Conway, at AOE Natalie, and the show at SYS Presents. If you're interested in finding out more about SYS Education, head to syseducation.org. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our exceptional team at SYS Education, including sound engineers Natalie Farrell and Matt Duran, and producer Bo Neal. I'd like to give a special shout out to Matt Duran as he moves from SYS Education on to new adventures in the world of technology. Matt has helped to make this podcast sound amazing over the last two seasons, and we are so grateful for his skill and his artistry. He'll be missed at SYS, but we're really excited for him to get to go learn new things too. Thanks again for listening today. Remember, just like Matt, we can learn new things.